uh, her name is Becky LeBoy. She's an education outreach specialist for the Ocean County Soil Conservation District. She has over 20 years of experience working as an educator in both formal and informal education and natural science settings. She holds an MA in education and a BS in environmental biology and a BA in international relations. Becky is joining us here tonight uh, to explore the Jersey Friendly Yards website. It's a tool for us, it's a tool for you, it's filled with resources. So Becky, um, I'm going to say welcome and look forward to you telling us all about Jersey Friendly Yards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. Thank you for that wonderful introduction and thank you to the entire uh, Hudson County chapter of the Native Plant Society of New Jersey for inviting me back uh, to speak tonight. I am very excited to be here and a very warm welcome to everyone out there, over 150 people. Gosh, thank you so much for joining me tonight. I'm really excited to share Jersey Friendly Yards. So I will get started. I am Becky LeBoy and I'm the Education Outreach Specialist with Ocean County Soil Conservation District. The primary purpose of a soil conservation district is to ensure compliance with state regulations regarding the disturbance and protection of soil. Uh, soil is a non-renewable resource and arguably one that we cannot live without. In the 1930s, during the Dust Bowl, severe dust storms caused major agricultural damage to American prairie lands. The storms were caused by severe drought, coupled with decades of extensive mismanaged farming practices. And we've since learned our lesson, don't treat your soil like dirt. The Ocean County Soil Conservation District has also developed an education program designed to heighten awareness about the importance of natural resources and their conservation and to promote environmental stewardship. And I am very fortunate to have the rewarding role of education outreach specialist for Ocean County Soil Conservation District. I offer a variety of educational programs that bring awareness to the importance of soil and water and plants and wildlife. And I encourage stewardship of our natural resources. And your role as a backyard gardener is a really important way for you to be an environmental steward as well. One of the many educational initiatives in which I participate is the Jersey Friendly Yards program. Jersey Friendly Yards is a statewide initiative that offers homeowners as well as schools, businesses, municipalities, communities, lots of ways to create healthy yards and landscapes for a healthy environment. This initiative is a collaborative effort by three different organizations, which include Ocean County Soil Conservation District, as well as Rutgers Cooperative Extension of Ocean County, and Jersey Friendly Yards is spearheaded by the Barnegat Bay Partnership. Barnegat Bay Partnership is a National Estuary Program, or an NEP, and it's one of only 28 NEPs in the entire country, which focus efforts on water conservation and preservation along our shores, in our estuaries, and at our headwaters. Together, our intention is to bring the message statewide that your behaviors and actions impact the quality and health of our landscapes and our environment. And you can play a positive role in the health of your community by creating a Jersey friendly yard. What does soil and water conservation and preservation have to do with gardening, you might be wondering. I'm going to start with a brief science lesson this evening. 
you may be familiar with the term eutrophication. Eutrophication is the overgrowth of algae in our local water bodies, including our bays and rivers, and maybe that stream that's right around the corner from your home. Eutrophication is caused by the overload of nutrients in stormwater runoff. One source of these nutrients is fertilizer from our lawns. When we inappropriately spread fertilizer on our lawns, some of it may run off the lawn during a rain event, wash down the street and down a storm drain. In New Jersey, our storm drains do not filter pollutants, so the fertilizers are channeled directly into the nearest water body. Our creeks and streams and rivers, they're all connected, so that fertilizer is then channeled to the next largest body of water, such as a lake or a bay, and then eventually into the ocean. Algae that naturally lives in water bodies at low levels, it feeds on fertilizer and it grows into what can be massive amounts and it causes numerous problems. It prevents light from reaching the bottom of the lake or bay, harming and killing plant and animal life. Also, when the algae dies and decomposes, it uses up the oxygen in the water for the decomposition process causing fish kills and dead zones. And in so doing, it also releases carbon dioxide in the water, which then lowers the pH of the water, causing acidification. Acidification slows the growth of fish and shellfish and can even impede the growth of the shells, preventing shell formation in shellfish, which of course will have a domino effect on the overall food chain in the ecosystem. Much of these fertilizer nutrients are coming from us, from homeowners, from businesses, from municipalities who apply fertilizers to lawns and gardens that may not even need them. And we can prevent this by changing our gardening and landscaping practices. The Jersey Friendly Yards website not only offers information to support the reduction of fertilizer use, it also offers information about eliminating pesticide use, creating a healthy foundation of soil, how to implement water conservation practices, creating habitat for wildlife, and planting for pollinators, and all with an emphasis on using native plants in the landscape. I'm going to introduce you to the Jersey Friendly Yards website and share with you some of my favorite tools and resources found on the website. And then I'll introduce you to one of the gardeners who implemented these practices and showcase her inspiring Jersey Friendly Yard. And throughout this evening's program, I'm going to showcase plants uh, within her landscape setting that require minimal, if any, fertilizer, absolutely no pesticides. Uh, her plants are drought tolerant where necessary. They provide food and other resources for wildlife. So let's go to the Jersey Friendly Yards website. So right now you should see the screen showcases the Jersey Friendly Yards website and my mouse is moving around the screen. And first I'm going to show you a couple of drop down menus under create a Jersey Friendly Yard uh, tab. There's the interactive yard and the eight steps to a Jersey Friendly Yard. And under the Jersey Friendly Plants tab in that drop down menu, I'm going to showcase the Jersey Friendly Plant Database. And I'll share with you a couple of other features of the website. So first, the interactive yard is a tool uh, that basically inspires uh, homeowners, landscapers, how to build a better yard. So you click this button to start the inter interactive yard and you start with a clean slate. So maybe a, a typical home, um, perhaps right after construction, uh, there's a house, a driveway, a couple of plantings, typically right near the home, and a whole lot of lawn. 
And over to the right, you'll see some tools. And you can click on these different tools. They provide you with some information and some of them actually offer uh, fun things to do to um, uh, break bad habits and teach you um, how to uh, improve your landscape uh, and make it healthier. So maybe you wanna take out your asphalt driveway or take out your old sidewalk and install pervious drive and walk. So you can install a new driveway and a new walkway. Uh, maybe you wanna remove some invasive plants, uh, invasive species wreak havoc on our landscape and we certainly don't want to plant them in our yard. And if you have invasives, it's a good idea to remove them. So in our front entrance bed, we're going to remove um, Japanese barberry. I am always frustrated to see Japanese barberry, especially when I'm going on a hike in beautiful New Jersey, especially up north. And I look into the woods and there's Japanese barberry everywhere. Uh, winter creeper, we're going to remove those. We're going to remove butterfly bush and summer snowflake and burning bush, all really common plants uh, that are in our landscapes. And I'm going to instead add a couple of beds around the house, maybe in the southeast corner. I'll add some beds there. And I'm going to add some Jersey friendly plants, maybe some blue star, some sedum, and some little blue stem. And in the front entrance, I'll add a bed there. And I'll add some English ivy. Oops, don't want to add English ivy, another invasive species. So it's a little learning tool. Do not use this plant. It's a non-native and considered highly invasive. How about some Eastern redbud? Excellent. And in the north side, I can add a little bit there. Lots of great plants, cinnamon fern, calorie pear. Uh-oh, another invasive species. Another tree I see growing absolutely everywhere. This one predominantly I see calorie pear all over South Jersey. It breaks my heart. Northern bayberry, wonderful native shrub. Hostas, they're not native, but as I'll explain later, they're considered Jersey friendly. Flowering dogwood, beautiful winterberry holly, river birch. So as you can see, you can continue to add some beds and add some plants to the beds. You can add uh, rainwater harvesting features, water conservation features, a little rain garden. You can add a rain barrel, um, add more beds to the front. You can add beds that attract pollinators. You can add a pollinator garden. You can start a little vegetable garden. And add that to your Jersey friendly yard. You can create a low impact lawn. There's a whole checklist that you can check off to create uh, a, an acceptable lawn. Uh, we love our lawns and um, it's absolutely okay to have a little bit of lawn in your yard. And there you go at the very end, you can see how you can be inspired to have a a lovely Jersey friendly yard, planting around the outside edges, the perimeter of your, your yard, planting around the perimeter of your home, some trees, some shrubs, pollinator gardens, uh, vegetable gardens, a rain barrel. So lots of features that you can play with in the interactive yard. Next, I'm gonna show you the eight steps to a Jersey friendly yard. And these eight steps, uh, each of these, Links, step one, plan before you plant. Each of these links click into pages and pages worth of more information and offer lots of different links to reputable uh, sources where you can find uh, more information. Plan before you plant uh, explains a little bit about how to plan and design your garden. And at the bottom of each of these pages, we offer additional resources that you can click, open and read. And the different steps are step one, plan before you plant. Step two, start with healthy soil. Of course, you'll click in here to learn how to take a soil test, where to send your soil test. Um, there's a little video in there, lots of soil resource links to go to. 
Water Wisely talks about water conservation in the yard. Fertilize Less talks about how harmful fertilizer is as I started off this program. Minimize risks when managing pest focuses on how to implement best practices uh, in your yard when you are trying to figure out how to maintain a healthy population of insects and bugs, including pollinators, in a very safe way, yet managing any pest problems. Reduce lawn size. As I said, we love our lawns. A little lawn is OK. Uh, reducing your lawn is really important. Um, Fill any nooks and crannies, perimeters of your yard with native gardens and Jersey friendly gardens and Jersey friendly landscapes and a little lawn in the middle is fine. Creating wildlife habitat. This is probably one of my favorite tabs right here. It teaches you how to create um, attractive uh, plantings, how to uh, in, implement and install um, human created structures such as nest box and water supplies and roosting boxes, how to provide overwintering areas, avoiding use of harmful chemicals and lots of resources uh, on this page as well. That's the reason why I plant my garden It's for the wildlife. I like to attract the birds and the butterflies. And finally, step eight, reduce, reuse, recycle in the yard focuses on composting and offers tips on how you can um, use mulch and compost in your garden for a healthier foundation. Finally, my favorite tool in the toolbox is the Jersey Friendly Plant Database. And you'll have most success if you actually register. We just ask for your name and um, some basic information. And once you register, you'll be able to uh, keep a plant list and actually print that, print that plant list out. And you can take that plant list with you to the nursery when you're ready to shop for your uh, garden plants. Now, over on the left-hand side are all the, the search filters that you'll use to select uh, your plants, you'll, you'll check off all the specific conditions in your yard, and that will match up to the plants on the right hand side. And this is our database, which includes about 400 different plants in our database. You can uh, either type in a specific plant if you're um, wanting to know a little bit of information about a, a particular plant. Um, I'll type in violet here. And anything that has the word violet in it will pop up. So it looks like there's one full page of something with a violet in it. This one is the one I'm looking for, Viola sor sororia, purple violet. But instead of looking up that particular plant, I'm going to see if I can find some plants for my garden. And so I'm going to check off these conditions, starting with uh, selecting the region in which I live. Um, I live in South Jersey. I'm sure we have a lot of folks here from North Jersey today and hopefully from all over the state. I'll check off Coastal Plain. Now, uh, we have some special ecoregions in New Jersey. We're really lucky. We have barrier islands and coastal areas, and we also have pine lands in the middle of New Jersey. I could check one of those off if I'm focusing uh, on landscaping in one of those areas. Uh, I'm not tonight, so I'm going to continue on down to plant type, which is pretty important. Do I want to buy ferns? Do I want to focus on flowers, grasses, ground covers, shrubs, trees, vines? I like flowers. I like perennial flowers. So you can see every time I, I check one of the boxes on the left, my um, plant database kind of narrows down my choices. So I'm now at 154 choices for perennial flowers in the coastal plain area. And here I can check off whether or not I want native plants only. And because we're the Native Plant Society, we want native plants only tonight. So 112 choices. I can look for bloom color. I can look for bloom time. If I have a lot of deer coming through my yard, I can check off high deer resistance plants. If I want to attract specific wildlife, say I want to find some plants specifically that hummingbirds are attracted to, I can check off this box. Now, light requirements, that's a pretty important condition. Uh, let's say my garden or the area where I'm landscaping in my yard gets full sun, I want to check that box off. 
And of course, soil type. I represent the soil district. That is arguably the most important condition we want to make sure we're uh, familiar with in our yard. And how about some sandy soil as I have here down in South Jersey. And my pH is probably going to be acidic or slightly acidic. I'm down to 70 different species. And what are the water conditions in my yard? Pretty dry. How about dr drought tolerance? I definitely want plants that are drought tolerant. So that really limits my choices, but I do not have any sprinkler systems. And when I water my plants in my garden, it's really just to say hello to them and kind of check them out and see how they're doing. So I'll say hi, and I don't need to click off, um, click on salt tolerance, but those of you who may be um, affected by salt spray, if you live near the coast, you might want to check that off. So let's see what we've got. We've got coastal plain, perennial flowers, natives that need full sun uh, or prefer full sun, live in sandy soil with a slightly acidic pH, uh, dry soil, and they have high uh, drought resistance. So I've got some beauties over here. Here's my list. And I have two pages worth of plants. And I can click on any of these and take a closer look. How about Asclepius verticillata, uh, world milkweed. I learned about world milkweed about two years ago. And I planted some in my garden and it's absolutely gorgeous. So up at the top, there's a couple of pictures uh, showing what the plant looks like, a description of the plant, including um, its bloom time, what it looks like, if there are any uh, caterpillars or any other wildlife that might benefit from this particular plant. We've added a specific wildlife value um, sentence or two. And then all the plant details, whether or not you've checked them off in the plant uh, database search filters, they're here anyway. So um, it tells us deer resistance high. Oh, good. Uh, soil characteristics, light needs of the plant, water needs, and size and growth. So this sounds like a great plant. Now, if I had um, registered or logged in, I would click on this wheelbarrow and it would turn orange and this plant would be added to my list. So eventually I could uh, log back in uh, and check out my plant list. And then I could, uh, as I said earlier, print that plant list out and actually take it with me. And uh, at the nursery, I can find all the plants I'm looking for, specifically using that scientific name that's really important that tells us exactly what plant that I want. So that's a, a quick overview of the plant database. I encourage you to check it out, add some of these plants to your holiday gift list this year. Uh, one more feature, a couple more features. I want to show you New Jersey native plants, where to buy them. A lot of times we know what we want, but we don't know where to get it. So we have a list. Uh, this is um, a, a growing list, and it's listed by county. Uh, it's all the nurseries that we vetted that sell native plants, at least um, I would say predominantly or have a good selection of native plants. And if there's something uh, that you're familiar with, a native plant nursery you're familiar with and you don't see it on this list, absolutely uh, let us know and we'll check it out and we're happy to add it. And you can contact us and let us know in a couple of different ways. You can connect with us uh, by clicking this little envelope and you'll uh, be sent to a form while you're, where you will fill out, um, you'll, you'll write us a letter basically, and you'll email that to Karen Walzer, and she's the public outreach coordinator for Barnegat Bay Partnership, and she is the uh, administrator of the Jersey Friendly Yards Initiative, and she will promptly write you back um, if you have any questions about plants specifically, you can ask an expert and you'll be taken to a form here. If you click on that one and fill in a little bit of information. You can even upload a photo. Maybe you have a question about a plant, its identity, or maybe about a, a pest that you might see on your plant. Select your particular county and this email will go to the Master Gardeners uh, in New Jersey for that particular county. And Karen Walzer will also get a copy of that particular email. So there's lots of other things that you can explore uh, on the website and I encourage you to do so.
So I'm going to go back to our PowerPoint uh, program and continue our show. Jersey Friendly Yards has about 400 plants in our plant database and a little over 300 of them are native to New Jersey. But a small handful of the rest, as I showed you, some are invasive species that are commonly planted in our landscapes that we flag as invasive species and encourage people not to plant them. But we do include in our database some commonly planted non-native but not invasive species, such as purple coneflower, threadleaf coreopsis, blue giant hyssop, woodland poppy, yucca, and many more. Perhaps you have some of these in your garden. These plants are not considered invasive and importantly, importantly, they provide ecological value to the landscape. So they provide food, maybe nesting material and nesting structures uh, for pollinators, birds and other wildlife. They don't require copious amounts of water or fertilizers and some provide erosion control and stabilization. And we've included these plants in our Jersey Friendly Plant Database, but as I pointed out earlier, you can select natives only in your search for plants if you would like to only plant natives. I do want to offer you a bit more information to guide your choices, so let's uh, take a look at New Jersey's geography and geology. To New Jersey's east is the Atlantic Ocean, to the south is the Delaware Bay, to the west is the Delaware River, and to the north, I, as you know, there's a straight line delineating the political border between New Jersey and New York and drawn on a map by humans. So this area is known to us as New Jersey, but plants, they do not pay attention to human-made boundaries. They do not know New Jersey from New York. They do, however, respond to geology, climate, soil, moisture, sunlight, and the environment as a whole. The map to the left shows the physiographic regions of New Jersey divided according to similar geology, including Ridge and Valley, Highlands, Piedmont, and the Coastal Plain. The map uh, to the right is a geologic map of New Jersey showing the many geologic features of the state. The coastal plain consists of relatively, relatively new sandy soil, uh, while the three regions of North Jersey consist of very old rock formations. This different geology offers different types of soil texture, different levels of soil moisture, and varying levels of pH, all important characteristics to consider when selecting plants for your garden. This beautiful ground cover called St. Andrew's Cross tolerates dry soil and full to part sun. Its small four petaled cross-shaped flowers bloom in July through September. Its natural range is Southeast United States and it reaches all the way North to the middle of New Jersey. So if you live in South Jersey, this is a great plant for your garden. It's a native plant for your garden. But if you live in Northern New Jersey, would you include St. Andrew's Cross in your garden? Because it is technically a native to our state of New Jersey, although North Jersey is clearly out of its native range. A cousin of St. Andrew's cross is shrubby St. John's wort, and here it is growing in my yard. It is native to New Jersey, but barely. Uh, the lime green shows nativity. The yellow shows places where it is historically native, but considered rare. And the mint green 
is where it is adventive, which means it was not historically native to this mint green area, but has naturalized. It has expanded its range over a relatively short period of time, either by humans or by birds or other means of movement. And there are now wild populations in the mint green areas up north there. So the question becomes, should we plant plants that are not native to the state of New Jersey, technically? Uh, there's a wide variety of answers and opinions. Uh, being that I'm speaking to the Native Plant Society of New Jersey, your answer is probably yes. But I wanted to provide some context to our collective decision making. And I also wanted to let you know that you can look up specific plants as well and find these same maps. Um, these maps are accessible on the Biota of North America program website. And I love looking at these maps because I, I think it's fun to find the exact nativity of different plants and see, uh, are they native to North or South Jersey? How far did their ranges expand? Um, and you can actually click on, you'll see my mouse moving to the left on the left-hand side. If you come to this page, click on list plants by genre. And that link will uh, take you to another page uh, where all the plants are alphabetized and you can scroll through the alphabetical list of plant genres to search for a specific plant you're interested in looking at and you can view their range maps. Jersey Friendly Yards has taken the approach that there are some non-native but not invasive plants that provide ecological value to wildlife, to the environment, and to humans that we have included in our database. But it is up to you to decide if you would like to plant just New Jersey natives or include some Jersey friendly non-natives in your yard. And Dr. Doug Tallamy, I understand you're having a, a book club uh, about his latest book on oaks, which is wonderful. That book is on my Christmas list. Uh, Dr. Doug Tallamy, he's an expert entomologist and he's an expert in native plants. And he suggests that at least 70% of your landscape should be native plants. So now I'd like to introduce you to Phyllis. Phyllis is a Jersey friendly gardener. She participated in a Jersey friendly pilot program in 2018, where 10 homeowners were offered several trainings, uh, which included uh, the dissemination of information about the Jersey Friendly Yards initiative, a tutorial focusing on the Jersey Friendly Yards website. Each participant had a site visit. I had the wonderful pleasure of visiting all 10 sites where we discussed options for their yards. They were provided with a soil test through Rutgers Soil Testing Laboratory and provided with $150 worth of native plants that they selected using the Jersey Friendly Yards database to get started on their yard. And Phyllis wanted to turn her lawn into an oasis for pollinators. Phyllis is also an Ocean County Master Gardener, and she's an active member of the Jersey Shore chapter of the Native Plant Society of New Jersey. So I'm excited to showcase her yard to you this evening. Less lawn means less mowing, less fertilizer, less water consumption, and spending more time enjoying a beautiful garden. Phyllis used the interactive yard tool to get some inspiration for how to plan her garden. First, we looked at the pathway the sun takes as it rises and sets over her yard from east to west. We noted any obstacles that shaded or blocked the light of the sun and what time of day that shadow was cast and for how long. In our assessment, the front of Phyllis's yard gets full sun all day long. Phyllis wanted to add some plants to her pre-existing foundation plantings next to her house, which consist of flowering perennials. She wanted to create a bed of native sun-loving plants along the street, including perennials and small shrubs. She wanted to leave a narrow pathway that starts at the driveway, 
crosses the front of her house and winds around to the side of her house where there's a stream below. It's a tributary of the Thomas River. And she has a shady, lovely wooded backyard. She wanted the pathway not only for easy access to her plants for maintenance, but she wanted to be able to bring small groups of people to her yard for garden tours. She took a sample of her soil and sent it to Rutgers Soil Testing Lab as part of the Jersey Friendly Yards pilot program. One of the soil attributes she had tested was soil texture. This is a soil pyramid. It was determined that she had a soil texture somewhere between sandy loam and loamy sand, meaning a high content of sand, somewhere between 65 and 80% sand with a small percent of clay and uh, silt mixed in. Not unus unusual for her South Jersey yard, but possibly very different from a North Jersey yard. So it's really important to get your own soil tested to see what soil texture you have in your yard. Different plants prefer different soil textures. Phyllis's sandy soil results in a well-drained soil, which does not hold on to water very well and can also dry out quickly. And this result means that uh, Phyllis will have much better success selecting drought tolerant plants for her yard. Her pH was 6.87, which is called, quote, very slightly acidic. And at the upper range of the optimum pH for many garden plants, as indicated in the green bar. Phyllis was focusing on native plants, many of which prefer soil even more acidic than Phyllis's soil. But instead of adding sulfur, which would lower the pH, Phyllis opted for adding organic matter to her garden once, once it was established. And organic matter is an excellent remedy to many soil issues and acts as a pH buffer to soils that may either be too acidic or too alkaline. The macronutrient levels of potassium, phosphorus, and calcium in Phyllis's soil were below optimum, but not excruciatingly low. And because she was focusing on native plants that thrive in dry, nutrient-poor soils, she opted to rely on organic matter inputs through the addition of compost rather than adding chemical fertilizers. The organic matter doesn't equate to uh, a direct input of nutrients. It's actually food for soil organisms. The nutrients are later excreted from these organisms once their bodies process the food, the organic matter. If you would like to get your soil tested like Phyllis did to find out your soil's texture, your soil's pH, nutrient levels, or other soil characteristics, visit step one and two on the eight steps to a Jersey Friendly Yard pages on the Jersey Friendly Yards website. Once Phyllis had all of this important information about her soil and soil moisture and light conditions, her next step was to create the beds. To create these large beds, she used a layering technique. She covered the lawn with cardboard, a layer of compost and a layer of mulch and let it sit for the winter. And by spring, the lawn was completely dead or mostly dead and the cardboard was soft enough to dig through and she then used the Jersey Friendly Plant Database to determine the right plants for her space. And she transformed her lawn into this beautiful Jersey Friendly Yard. And there's Phyllis, she's right behind her mailbox practically obscured by her booming and blooming Jersey Friendly Garden. Phyllis hosted two garden tours this past summer for the Jersey Shore chapter of the Native Plant Society of New Jersey, showcasing her garden and all of the pollinators attracted to her plants. So let's take a virtual walk through her garden and see the colors and the textures and all the life that abounds. She chose four different kinds of milkweed, 
to plant in her Jersey family garden, which support monarch caterpillars, as well as adult butterflies and bees and other pollinators. She chose common milkweed, Asclepias syriaca, butterfly weed, Asclepias tuberosa, swamp milkweed, Asclepias incarnata, and that beautiful world milkweed I showcased earlier, Asclepias verticillata. And this large perennial that is growing like a shrub is wild bergamot, Monarda fistulosa. When I was on the tour walking past this gorgeous plant, I could actually hear the hum of all the bees. There must have been a bee on every single flower. Flowers in the mint family, such as this one, are very attractive to bees and other pollinators. They are also untasty to deer, making them a great plant for gardens in areas with high populations of deer. Phyllis added a variety of perennials in her foundation beds. In July, uh, they added lots of bright colors to her garden. And this photo was taken about a month or so earlier than that previous slide. And here I wanna point out showy goldenrod. It's a gorgeous native that Phyllis added to her foundation plantings. And showy goldenrod tends to bloom July through September and even later in the fall after many other goldenrods are finished blooming. They grow in dry, sandy soil. Uh, they also grow in clay or loamy soils, so they tolerate lots of different soil conditions. And they also have a high drought tolerance. And she did make a very conscientious effort to select drought tolerant plants to conserve water. Uh, Phyllis also has stiff goldenrod and seaside goldenrod growing in her garden, both New Jersey natives. The plant on the left is stiff goldenrod, uh, and the plant on the right is, well, the one on the left is stiff goldenrod actually growing in Phyllis's garden, and the plant on the right is stiff goldenrod planted in a different Jersey-friendly demonstration garden in Tom's River, but it is blooming, so I wanted to show you both. Um, and you can see just how many bees are flying around that stiff goldenrod on the, on the right. It's um, a pollinator magnet. Bees, ants, beetles, moths, butterflies, all primarily seeking nectar are attracted to this beautiful plant. And the caterpillars of many moths feed on various parts of different goldenrod species. And deer and rabbit do occasionally eat the vegetative parts of the plant. However, many goldenrods contain mildly poisonous chemicals that do deter some herbivores. Birds benefit in many ways from goldenrod, and pictured here is a beautiful ruby-crowned kinglet perched on seaside goldenrod, gleaning tiny caterpillars and other insects from the foliage. And this pine siskin is gorging on seaside goldenrod seeds in the fall, along with several dozen members of its flock, and it is an important food source during migration. Phyllis also included blue giant hyssop Agastache phoeniculum in her garden. And here a silver spotted skipper is nectaring on the flowers. And it's possible you have this plant in your garden. It is so commonly planted and such a staple in so many gardens that you may think this is a native New Jersey plant. And it is actually not native to New Jersey, but native to the Northern Midwest of the United States. But if you're planting for the purpose of providing ecological value to your yard, offering food for pollinators and birds and wildlife, and you're willing to make an exception for a non-native to New Jersey, but not invasive plant, then this would be an excellent choice and perhaps part of that 30% that Doug, Dr. Doug Tallamy is allowing us to, to plant. But if you would like to stick with New Jersey natives strictly, there's two other similar plants in uh, the same family, same genre, Agastache scrofulifolia. I'm sure I didn't pronounce that right. Commonly called purple giant hyssop and Agastache nepotoides. 
commonly called yellow giant hyssop. Um, they're both native to New Jersey, although they are considered rare in the wild in our state. I have all three Agastakis growing in my garden and I love them all. Um, these two reach heights uh, up to and above six feet. They are very tall. Um, they have really thick square central stems as do all members of the mint family have square stems, um, which they are members of the mint family. And their flowers are similar to the blue giant hyssop, but not as full or showy, although they are just as attractive to pollinators. Um, they have a very long bloom time. The flowers open slowly over a period of about six weeks. And purple giant hyssop is sensitive to competition in the wild. It relies on soil disturbance to germinate and propagate. Um, the leaves of yellow giant hyssop don't have a strong scent like other mints in the mint family, um, but they are bitter tasting to deer and all three plants are fairly highly deer resistant. So continuing our walk down the pathway, you can see Phyllis has a variety of flowering perennials. Uh, you probably recognize the purple cone flower on the immediate right, Echinacea purpurea. Purple coneflower is ubiquitous and often assumed native. It is actually a prairie plant. We love it because it's showy, long lasting, daisy like flowers bloom nonstop throughout the summer. It tolerates a range of conditions, including drought and poor soil. Purple coneflower is a wildlife friendly plant, providing nectar for butterflies, bees, and hummingbirds, and also seeds for birds. And again, it's one of Phyllis's small percentage of non-natives that provide ecological support and function in her garden. And growing next to the coneflower is dense blazing star, Liatris spicata. Spikes of fluffy purple flowers on rigid stalks bloom from the top down from July through August. And while this plant prefers moist fertile soil, it will tolerate poor dry soil. Uh, Dense Blazing Star is a valuable food plant for native bees and, uh, and also bumblebees, and it's best planted in masses or as a vertical accents in borders. It's definitely one of my favorites. Mixed in with the uh, wild bergamot and uh, purple coneflower, Phyllis planted Virginia Mountain Mint, a spectacular flowering perennial that thrives in dry or moist, sandy clay or loamy soil in full sun or part shade. And although it's not known for its showy flowers, the mountain mint is extremely attractive to pollinators. They just can't seem to get enough, and luckily for them, the flowers are continuously producing nectar, as most mints do. The leaves have a, a silvery green color and a really lovely texture. Um, there are several species of native mountain mint, and I would consider this a must-have plant in any Jersey family yard. So notice that Phyllis has educational signs in her garden, teaching visitors about the importance of natives to pollinators in both the adult and larval form. And she is pointing to um, shrubby St. John's wort and the flowers bloom uh, June through August. And these flowers uh, do not produce nectar. Uh, they are visited by pollen-seeking bumblebees and helictic bees and surfid flies. Um, I have, I showed this plant earlier, I have it in my yard as well. It has kind of a bluish green, very fine textured foliage, um, and that foliage actually contains a toxic chemical, hypericin, which deters deer brows. Uh, but the chemical is tolerated by caterpillars, caterpillar specialists of uh, gray hair streak butterflies and also a variety of other moths who also use the plant as a host. The fruit is a dry capsule and it persists until the following spring. It's very pretty. Um, the foliage turns uh, kind of a, a yellowish green in the fall 
And as the shrub matures, the older woody stems turn a very attractive reddish brown color and begin to exfoliate. And that also offers some uh, winter interest in the garden. And this plant thrives in full sun or part shade. Uh, notice that Phyllis, um, uh, I, did I show you this already? Uh, she has those beautiful educational signs. Um, she's also created uh, labels for her plants, indicating uh, different qualities and characteristics uh, as noted in the Jersey Friendly Yards plant database, for example. Uh, the different images state that swamp milkweed is native to New Jersey. Um, you can see it tolerates rabbit and deer browse. Uh, it attracts beneficial insects uh, and bees and butterflies. And it is host plant for the larva of monarchs. So very clever. Couple more plants here. Uh, Black-eyed Susans are in bloom. Uh, to the left is seaside goldenrod, not quite blooming yet. And to the right is common evening primrose, also not yet blooming. Back by the coneflower and wild bergamot, she has a nine bark shrub uh, that flowered in early summer and is forming uh, drooping clusters of red berries for the birds by this time of year. And nine bark is a beautiful native wild life friendly deciduous shrub. And it is valued for its exfoliating bark. Um, it has layers of reddish brown inner bark and that offers winter interest. This plant tolerates poor soil conditions. Um, those clusters of pinkish white flowers bloom May through June and they provide an excellent nectar source for native bees. Um, I have to say though, this plant is not deer resistant. I have one in my yard and the deer enjoy it very much. So as we turn the corner and begin to head north uh, behind Phyllis's house towards the stream, a large patch of common milkweed leans in towards the sun. Its leaves are host to monarch caterpillars as I'm sure you know. Um, and also to other beneficial insects such as this lace wing. And two tiny eggs were found on this milkweed seed pod. The monarch egg looks like a teeny tiny little pearl and the lace wing egg is a teeny tiny white dot hanging on by a thread. Kind of fun to see this in her garden. And across the path from the milkweed, right above the stream that trickles past Phyllis's yard, she showcases Helen's flower and great blue lobelia, two gorgeous plants. And you can see how the Helen's flower receives full sun, but the lobelia is in kind of slightly part shade. Helen's flower, also called common sneezeweed, uh, it does not cause allergies, however. Um, they have daisy-like flowers uh, with really distinctive fan-shaped rays and prominent raised centers. And the flowers bloom from late summer until frost. And the colors range from this beautiful bright yellow to somewhat of a reddish brown to orange. And these plants can get pretty tall and they add some vertical texture to gardens, uh, but they might need to be staked or you can cut the plants back in early June uh, for a bushier growth with more blooms. And sneezeweed or Helen's flower is very attractive to native bees. Um, you can plant it in the back of borders and beds in wildflower gardens and naturalized areas. It does prefer moist to wet soil, but Phyllis's yard is somewhat dry and it's doing really well in her yard. Um, she does have a layer of mulch, which helps to keep moisture locked in her soil. I have a couple more plants to get to. And here is the blue lobelia, the great blue lobelia. Um, its native habitat includes swamps and moist low areas. However, it does tolerate some drought and its blue color is just absolutely stunning. Um, you can also use great blue lobelia in the back of borders to add depth to your garden and you can plant it in rain gardens and wildlife gardens and woodland gardens. 
and um, it offers uh, absolutely beautiful color. Uh, and it is in my garden anyway, it is deer resistant. And then tucked among her plants, uh, Phyllis has cleverly added some recycled garden decor. Uh, step eight is reduce, re use, recycle. Uh, I talked about earlier, focuses predominantly on compost, but uh, does talk a little bit about how um, important it is for us to reuse and recycle. And Phyllis is so clever to find, uh, for example, this broken pot and plate, and she stacked them on top of each other and filled the top one with marbles and she added water and it's an instant watering trough for thirsty insects. So she rescued these items and so many more from the side of the road on trash day uh, on their way to the landfill. And she's just so clever and creative with reusing these materials in her garden for both function and beauty. So walking further down the pathway on the north side of the house, the light is limited and the soil is able to hold a bit more moisture and several species of ferns are growing, including Christmas fern um, and ostrich fern. And then out from behind the shade of her house, uh, garden phlox is growing, very happy and healthy in this partly sunny location. And it is very attractive to many pollinators, including clear wing moths. In this partly sunny, partly shady area of her yard, closer to the woods behind Phyllis's house, the soil is richer with organic matter. Rose mallow, Hibiscus muschetos, thrives in either sandy or loamy soil. It prefers full sun, but tolerates part, uh, part shade. And it prefers well-drained to medium-drained moist soil, but tolerates well-drained dry soil. I'll tell you, I have some of these growing in my yard and my yard is very, very dry and um, they're very prolific. It's a beautiful plant. And she has some wild ginger growing in her shady woodland. Um, the fallen leaves provide a natural mulch, a natural organic uh, um, foundation that keeps the soil moist just the way wild ginger likes it. And she has bloodroot. I would love to grow this in my yard. Uh, this native likes part to full shade with moist but well-drained organic soil. And it has stunningly beautiful white flowers that bloom in the spring and they last only a short time. Um, and the leaves here, you can see they're, they're mingled in um, with bloodroot and those of summer sweet in the back there, the back left. And summer sweet is a shade loving shrub found growing in uh, dappled woodlands with moist, well drained soil. And it's a nectar plant for butterflies and attractive to a variety of beneficial insects and pollinators. And um, uh, I've pushed this plant to the edges of its uh, range of tolerance in my own garden and found that it can tolerate part sun and uh, even full shade. Uh, but it's important to keep in mind that there are many factors at work that support plant growth. Although a plant may have a wide range of tolerance for light conditions, it may be very picky about uh, soil moisture or soil texture, and it may be tolerating the light ranges just because the other conditions are optimum. So if a plant is subject to less than optimum conditions for more than one factor, say a light soil texture and moisture, it may not thrive. So finally, we reach the other side of Phyllis's yard and her monarch way station where she's growing uh, more milkweed and some bone set. And I'm sure it's common knowledge with uh, this uh, audience that milkweed is, a, is an important food source for monarch butterfly caterpillars. And then here's some common bone set uh, planted among the milkweed. It's a clumping perennial. It has small white flowers that bloom from July through September and butterflies such as this common buckeye value the nectar as a food source. And it is also a host plant for numerous butterfly and moth caterpillars. 
And Bone said, if you have some in your yard, then you know that it will readily reseed, um, uh, self-seed and spread. Um, but it will offer you an instant meadow in just a few short seasons. Um, so do be careful uh, as it will reseed itself prolifically. Um, bone set mixes well with grass-leaved goldenrod, um, ironweed, and wingstem, all native to New Jersey. Uh, wingstem is also a very prolific uh, reseeder. Um, so they can get a little bit weedy, I will call them. Um, so it's best to plant them in a large area, or if you're creating a wild meadow, these are some excellent choices. Um, personally, I consider these to be low maintenance plants in my yard because once established, they do not need watering, fertilizer care. You can basically ignore their maintenance and just enjoy their beauty. So in conclusion, when planning your Jersey friendly garden, think carefully about the many conditions to which you're subjecting your plants, including the soil and the water and the light. Get your soil tested and watch the light patterns change as the sun crosses the sky over your yard. Select plants that match these conditions in your yard. If you have dry soil, instead of setting up a sprinkler, select drought tolerant plants. Um, consider their nativity and also consider the ecological value that each plant brings to pollinators and to wildlife. Eliminate any invasive species growing in your yard. And gardening is not an exact science, but observing your own yard's micro ecosystem and observing your plant's response to it can help you grow a healthy and thriving Jersey friendly yard. Visit the Jersey Friendly Yards website frequently and take advantage of the many tools and resources available to you. And don't hesitate to contact me by email with any questions that you may have. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have now. And thank you all so much for joining me tonight. Wow, Becky, that was really, that was great. That was really a wonderful presentation. And, um, you know, I, we went a little over time, but do you have a few minutes? Yep. I do, absolutely. Okay, so let's get right to it and ask some of these questions here that are in the Q&A. And everyone out there, if you have uh, any questions for Becky, she has a few extra minutes, just put them in the Q&A and we'll um, try to get to it. So this first question here is from John asking, um, can you save the site design that you create? Can you save it? On the Jersey Friendly Yard website, no. Um, so the interactive yard um, is almost like um, a tool to I'll say play around, uh, to look at a blank slate and see how you can add plants around the perimeter of the yard, around the house. Uh, it offers different um, inspiring um, features such as the rain barrel or vegetable garden or a pollinator garden or changing out your asphalt driveway for something that um, allows water to percolate through. So it's really for inspiration, um, not so much for planning and designing. But if you go to the uh, step one, plan before you plant, there's lots of different resources um, that you can link to that would offer you perhaps uh, a few more tools in your toolbox to help plan and design your garden. But I guess John could always screenshot it too, right? If he wanted oh, yeah. to, yeah, we, I could, you could save it like that. Um, oh yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Take a photo of it. Yep. Priscilla wants to know, I was thinking of putting out seeds that need cold stratification in January or February under some fabric tunnels to protect young plants from deer. Any strategy, any comments? Um, definitely uh, native plants, not all, but many native plant seeds need stratification. Uh, I do worry about climate change and what's going to happen if um, we don't get enough cold, you know, freezing nights uh, this season. We shall see. Um, there is a, a, a wonderful um, company called um, 
prairie moon nursery, I believe, and they sell seeds and plants. And in their um, plant database, not that I'm steering you away from Jersey Friendly Yards, but it's a feature that we don't have in ours. Um, on, on their database, uh, in the seed section, they'll actually tell you um, the types of conditions that that particular species seed needs in order to uh, germinate properly. Um, some seeds don't need to be stratified at all. Uh, so last year or this, this past season when I was too late to stratify seeds, I looked in their uh, website to see which ones can I plant now for some instant, you know, summer garden. Um, so uh, horse mint was one of them, I recall, and there were a couple others that um, I had missed my cold window for stratifying seeds. So I, I got some good information from Prairie Moon Nursery website. Um, regarding the fabric, I, I'm not quite sure. I've never used fabric myself um, when planting a garden. Uh, sometimes one tip I can offer is uh, if you're gonna start seeds in pots, um, that's always a good idea. Uh, you can cover those. Um, the seed has all the energy it needs in order to germinate. It doesn't necessarily need the sunlight. It's not going to photosynthesize. It's a seed. So um, you can put those maybe somewhere close to your house so they're not out in your garden and you're, you know, missing opportunities to see, okay, this little seedling is all dried out and going to die now. It's near your, your house. It doesn't, it can be in the shade. Uh, is another tip, doesn't need to be in full sun, probably shouldn't when it's that young, when you're just trying to germinate it. Um, but okay. Yeah, keep the squirrels out. All right, well, let's move on. Who, Steve is interested to know who designed this website. Were you part of that? Um, I was uh, not part of the design of the website, but I do, um, uh, I, I did add a little bit of content and uh, a lot of the plants in the database. And that's one of my favorite jobs is to continue to research plants and add them to the database. So that, that's my little role I played. Um, but um, the website is, um, hopefully I'll get this correct, Fusion Sparks Media. Uh, Kevin Sparkman, his ah. name is. And um, he is the, the website designer. So let's see, I'm sharing the website again. I think his, is he at the bottom here? Nope. Nope, no longer. Uh, Fusion Spark Media, I believe, is the name of his um, company who designed the website, Fusion Spark Media. Well, wow. he, he's actually. Um, uh, active Kevin Sparkman. He's active in the Pineland Preservation Alliance. Okay. And well, Trevor, Trevor you did an excellent. It's yeah, amazing. He did. Yes. Um, it, going back a second, someone in the chat is asking the Prairie Nursery you recommended. That was Prairie Moon, right? Prairie Moon Nursery, I believe so. Yeah. Prairie Moon Nursery. Okay. So <laughs> Gail is asking Is there a, um, a landscape design software that you would recommend for some of us? A landscape In to this, she's asking if there's a software. Yeah, I'm not familiar. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, John would like to know, so he found the platform, but doesn't see how to pull the menu down for edibles. Just about everything else he sees. Do you have edibles? Not yet. It's definitely... Okay something we're thinking of considering, like seriously thinking of considering. Um, there's lots of wonderful native edibles and then there's some wonderful non-native, but we would still consider them Jersey friendly edibles. Yeah, I mean, I think another question that we've gotten into the Hudson um, chapter is how to not necessarily eat or make eat the um, native edibles, but how to get your organic garden sort of in mixed in with your natives and can you do that can yeah. you have a vegetable bed and then put your native plants around it well it just so happens that um as i mentioned we had 10 
Jersey friendly uh, gardeners in our pilot program. Phyllis was one of them. Um, another one, her name is Lisa Mazuka. Uh, she's actually watching tonight. I think I see it. Yes, she's here. Yes. <laughs> she um, is really into um, food gardening. So her yard has Jersey friendly plants, natives, non-natives, and mixed in there, she has lots of um, food that she grows, different types of berries. And um, uh, it, it's on my mind. And Lisa, uh, I'm going to, you know, we'll connect. And uh, at some point in the future, you know, maybe six months, a year from now, uh, we'll put together um, a program showcasing her garden and her yard that showcases all of her beautiful um, native and non-native, but her Jersey friendly edible yard. We'd love to see that, Lisa. We'll get um, back to you. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Okay, moving on. Crane, he says, um, he lives in Mammoth County. He's looking for native, native evergreen dense shrub that we grow along our fence to prevent deer jumping over to our property. Do you have any recommendations? We're thinking about American holly, but would like to consider an alternative. Yeah, so a native evergreen dense shrub. Uh, American holly is a gorgeous, gorgeous tree. It takes a really long time to grow. Um, so I don't know if you can wait that long. Um, there are other uh, native shrubs, evergreen inkberry holly is a lovely one, it's in the holly family, it's Ilex glabra, but it is a shrub and deer will clearly be able to jump over it. So um, uh, Juniperus virginiana, eastern red cedar. Um, I have a, a wall of eastern red cedars that I grew um, in part of my yard where um, I wanted to let the whole area overgrow basically uh, and not have it be seen by the public because um, it would look, you know, I guess like an eyesore to some. Uh, so I planted all these junipers and I planted them about 10 years ago and they're all probably about 15 to 20 feet now. Uh, wow. so they do grow pretty quickly. Great wildlife uh, tree, uh, birds eat the berries. Um, Have you seen the cedar wax wings? Oh yeah, they're all over my yeah. yard. Oh, I'm still trying to catch a glimpse of the cedar wax wings out here in Jersey City, but you know, people have sighted them, but mm -hmm. I know they love the cedars, the yeah. cedar. Wings. They're also a great plant for uh, a tree for um, overwintering owls. Little saw wet owls will, uh, you know, take cover, take shelter in the evergreen boughs of the Eastern red cedar. So it's a good choice. Wow, okay, well, we have just a couple more here and then we will let you go. Um, so how can you use these garden planning tools if you already have some plants? Mm -hmm. So uh, Anna's asking, okay, so they are not native, but you would still like to keep for sentimental reasons. I think that's a good question. Yeah. I think we get that, you know, we're all kind of attached to some of the things that are not native. Sure. Um, we do understand that, uh, I think the Jersey Friendly Yards, uh, initiative, one of the reasons why we didn't go completely native is because, well, for one, we know how difficult it is, at least right now, uh, to purchase native plants. We certainly do want to encourage, you know, purchasing native plants and planting native plants, but sometimes it's really hard to find them. Um, so some alternatives are non-natives, but definitely not invasive. So together, natives and non-natives that are not invasive together are called Jersey friendly. And um, as Doug Tallamy said, you know, at least 70% native, but there's that 30% of um, those non-natives like the purple clone flower and um, other plants that um, are not invasive, but are not native to this particular area. Um, what was her exact question again? She wanted to know. She just was asking um, if there are any tools on the website or how can you use these tools if you already have some non-native stuff growing? Can mm -hmm. you still use the, the garden tools on your site? Oh, of course. 
um, one thing she can do is um, first determine, you know, who lives in her yard. So that's always a, a fun exercise is to get to know all the other life in your yard, kind of make a, you know, catalog all the different species and determine uh, what their scientific name is and then see if they are native to New Jersey or native to the, your area in New Jersey or not. Uh, if they're an invasive species, you probably want to remedy that if possible. We know that's not always possible, but um, you know, eventually replace it with a native. Um, and on our website, you can actually type in the name of, of the plant as I showed you in the search bar. So if you have like a Japanese barberry or something like that, you can type it in and we offer alternatives, native alternatives to um, those invasive species. Um, so that's one way you can use the tool. But um, yeah, if you're looking to kind of enhance or enlarge your space, your garden, your shrubs, your trees, um, yeah, you can definitely use the tools to landscape your yard. I know for myself, I took out a, a uh, butterfly bush this year and replaced it with a button bush. And I oh, thought, nice. yeah, I thought that was a really good option. <laughs> you know, it was a beautiful, shrub but it was hard it was hard i can sympathize with ann mm -hmm. um it, this i love this next question this is so important um how can we encourage our local family-run nursery you know wherever we are they sell mostly non-natives to carry native plants because sometimes you have to drive you know an hour to get to a good native nursery so how can we start bringing them into yeah. the picture. Yes. Um, one of our past presidents of the Native Plant Society of New Jersey, um, her name is Kathy Salisbury. Um, she used to um, kind of peddle these little kind of like business cards. She would print them out and she gave them to all the chapter leaders and said, you know, pass these out to everyone. And on the business card, it said something like, um, I'm looking for blank, uh, you know, please stock this or something like that. And whatever plant it is that you're looking for and that nursery doesn't have it, you write it down and then you'd hand that to the proprietor of the, of the nursery and say, I'm looking for this. Does it work? I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, it's supply and demand. So um, if more of us keep asking for natives, then, um, you know, yeah. they're gonna have to stock them. It's really also, I think one of the audiences, our Jersey Friendly Yards Initiative really wants to kind of engage our landscapers because they're gonna plant what you tell them. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't yeah. know, they're gonna plant the same old, same old, you know, what's in stock, Japanese barberry and all the other commonly planted non you know, non-native and invasive species. Um, so we do need to educate our landscapers. So that's- um, Definitely. Well, I wish that we could get to all of these questions. Um, can you take one more and sure. or one more question? So, okay. So when do you, uh, when do you start cutting back some of these plants? We've all, all leave them up throughout the winter, right? To seed and, and become a food source for the the birds, but when do you start cutting them back in the spring? Yeah, that's a good question. It's, it's a question uh, I, I will just offer you anecdotally, uh, not as a horticulturalist, but um, I try to wait as long as possible in the spring. And it is hard because, you know, winter, winter can be long and then you see the little green shoots coming out of the ground and you just want to kind of like clean up your whole garden and see yeah. you know, all the life that's that's booming um but that's a, a period of time surely where insects are just starting to awaken and they're just starting to emerge from you know those hollow and pithy stems that they've spent you know the whole winter inside in your garden so um i anecdotally try to wait till can I even say May, if I can wait that long? Um, and then when I do cut my pithy stems down, my brown stems, um, I've learned that some of them I, I might cut low, but some I leave a little bit high because they actually are the stakes <laughs> that 
those plants need anyway, you know, instead of me yeah. like cutting everything down and then restaking them, I'm like, okay, those stems are really thick and tough. I'm going to leave a few and they're going to kind of act as natural stakes anyway. Um, ones that I do cut down, I usually lay right there in the garden because I don't know if there's insects that are still inside them that need, you know, to come out. So before I throw them in my compost pile, I lay them right there and they kind of act as mulch anyway. Um, so yeah, again, anecdotally, I'll say May. Pat Sutton is a wonderful resource if you're not aware of who she is. She's done lots of um, uh, Jersey friendly webinars when we do series and uh, she has a great website and she has um, a newsletter group called uh, the Garden Gang, Pat Sutton's Garden Gang. So if you get on her newsletter, she's always offering, she has you know, 35, 40, 45 years of experience with native gardening. She was one of the pioneers of native gardening. Um, she offers lots of really great tips on uh, uh, topics that you're asking about. Well, thank you. I wanna just say thank you so much for, I wish we could get to every single question, but I know you have to go. And, um, but I wanna, you know, you, you came back and that was so nice of you. Thank you for Put having me back. The way we, we no. uh, ended it last week. So, um, so thank you so much for your, for being so gracious. Um, and people, we just posted your contact information in the chat so people can contact you. I see some questions in the chat about maybe possible other speakers for different groups so they can contact you um, through, uh, you know, your email address. That's okay to post. Oh, please. And, and if there are folks with questions that you're, you know, dying to ask and we've run out of time tonight, uh, I apologize. I did go over please email me. I'm happy to either answer them or send them to one of my colleagues, another, you know, professional expert uh, that would be able to offer you an answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and everybody watching tonight that's still here, I just want to uh, say thank you to all of you. You've made us really happy this year. It's been a really very successful webinar year with amazing guests. Um, I won't be able to list them all right now. And next year coming up is, is going to be great too. So we've got a lot of good presenters lined up. Take our survey and let us know what you want to hear. If you know some great people that we should be in contact with, we'd love to hear about them. Um, happy holidays to everybody, whatever you celebrate, whether it's Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever it is. Happy New Year. God bless everyone. And uh, Becky, we'll see you next year. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's been wonderful. And congratulations to your chapter. And my goodness, yeah. you are doing an amazing job, your, your entire team of Hudson County uh, chapter leaders. So well, thank, thank you. We're you. having a lot of fun. And uh, thank you to Tara and Millie and Heather and everybody on the webinar committee. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye.